Thank you very much, Tony, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's really nice to be with you here at NVTC. Uh, a couple of words, and I'll be fairly brief this morning. Um, NVTC is just a great organization, and Bobby Kilberg and everybody here who's been associated with it on the board of directors deserves an enormous amount of credit because as all of us travel all over the world, uh, NVTC and Northern Virginia are getting the type of recognition we deserve as one of the two technology centers of the entire world. So I commend everybody, and those of you who aren't active in NVTC, uh, please step up and do something because it's important for all of us who live and work here in this region. So thanks to everybody for everything you're doing because it's important. What I want to spend a few minutes talking with you about uh, are basically some observations that I have uh, from living in the middle of the dot-com revolution for the last five and a half years. It's really been a distinct pleasure and honor uh, to do that while this entire global internet economy has evolved. So it's been a unique experience and um, I hope that a few things I have to say today will be of value to some of you in the audience who um, are working and living in the e-commerce industry. So I want to talk to you a few minutes about what I call the global tidal wave of e-commerce and key issues for the e-commerce industry. And I call it the global, global tidal wave. People put a lot of different spins on this, but as I travel all over the world and talk to people about what's evolving, there is no question in my mind that we are in the middle of the most dramatic business transformation that I certainly have lived in through 30 years of the industry that I've been involved in, the tech industry. There are a lot of people around the globe right now because of the drop in the stock market prices and capitalizations of these companies who believe this is some type of fluke. There are a lot of people who believe that all over the world, and I'm going to comment a bit on that today. Uh, this is a tidal wave. It is going to sweep the globe. It will change the way business and government is operated in almost every single country in the globe. You all know the story, but I call this, how did the internet evolve? And there are two key messages I want to leave you with here. The 70s, of course, as you all know, were early DOD DARPA involvement in the R&D business. And that's the way I got involved in it, having been sent to Washington as a Navy young guy in 1969. And I served at DARPA from 1969 to 1971. In those days, we called it ARPA. So uh, after I got there, about four months later, we put the first money into something called the ARPANET, which today, of course, is the internet. So for me, this has been about 31 years of watching the evolution of this. In the 1980s, the NSF and the universities got into the business more heavily as DOD decided that they were going to get out of that business of the ARPANET. Um, and the NSF really took uh, guidance of what went on. And if it hadn't been for key decisions that were made by senior officials, uh, both at the Department of Defense and more so in my mind at the National Science Foundation in those days, I do not believe we would have gotten to the next phases of this, which was business commercialization and then U.S. government privatization. Uh, I watched those decisions be made, and there were some very bright people who did the right things, which caused what's happened today to actually transpire. If certain government policy decisions had gone the other way, we would not have had the opportunity in the private sector to have a dot-com revolution. So the point I want to make there is it is as important for each and every one of you to get involved in the political process. I cannot tell you how important it is in my mind, uh, having been in the dot-com wars on the front line and having the privilege of testifying six times before the U.S. Congress about various aspects of this revolution. If you do not get up there and you do not speak your mind and you do not tell people why certain things should not be done and what should be done, in your opinion, this industry will suffer, and I'll comment on that in a minute. So thank heavens we had very uh, good decision making in the National Science Foundation uh, that caused a lot of money, time, and effort to go into the right parts of the development of the infrastructure. In the 1990s, we all know about the business commercialization, which was the next phase or next wave of the e-commerce and internet revolution. And by 1995, decisions that were made at the Department of Commerce, again, in my mind, very rational, thoughtful decisions that took some years to hammer out, uh, caused the U.S. government to move in the direction of privatization. These were, again, important decisions. 
Uh, that basically led us into network solutions, and these are key milestones. I won't belabor the story. Many of you know it and have heard it. The key events in terms of the financing and business side were in March of 1995. I acquired Network Solutions on behalf of SAIC for $4.8 million. No one cared about domain names in those days. Nobody knew anything about them. Uh, in September of 97, we had a very successful IPO. We raised about $68 million at that time at $18 per share. In February of 99, we did our first secondary offering, which was very successful, and we raised $779 million. That was at that time, as Tony said, the largest internet equity offering in history. Then this last February, we went back out on the road and did a follow-on, and that was very successful, and we raised $2.3 billion. And that was, again, the largest internet equity offering in the history of the country. And then in June, as most of you know, we made a decision as a board of directors to merge with VeriSign uh, based in Mountain View, California. That was ended up the total purchase price being $19.3 billion, the largest pure internet merger in the history of the world. So these have been the key milestones from a business and financial standpoint. Uh, I'd make two comments about this chart. Number one is I have uh, been on many panels and conferences all over the world uh, where leaders of internet and e-commerce companies have been there. I've heard lots of people talk about uh, we hate investment bankers. They're bad news. We wish they weren't in our businesses. Um, I have exactly the opposite reaction. Uh, the investment bankers uh, helped our company uh, more than any single group of people outside of our own employees to build this company. So if you have the wrong bankers, get rid of them and find yourself the right bankers. That's all I'd say to you. So people who make comments like that in my mind typically have had bad experiences or have picked the wrong teams of bankers. They can help you do things to make your company global leaders that you could not do by yourself. Uh, the second comment I'd make about this is why we did this in terms of merging was because I am a true believer that when you're in the middle of the biggest business revolution that I've lived through in my lifetime or we are living through in all of our lifetimes, uh, the bigger and stronger will survive and prosper. So this is going to be one of the key trends. And what we did by doing that was create the largest internet infrastructure trusted services company in the globe. How has dot-com affected the online marketplace? All of you know this story. I've simply added from our last quarterly earnings report the continued growth. Um, in Q1, we reported there were 9.9 .9 million dot-com um, uh, registrations, and by uh, the second quarter, Q2 of this year, we were up to 11.8 million. Uh, with competitors, there are almost 20 million dot-coms, the domain names registered around the globe. This growth continues on. Why I put the next two charts up is because I am very, very impressed by what I see all over the world in terms of what regions of the world have seen the most growth. Uh, recall, and we all know the story, uh, this started out as an American invention basically built and funded by the United States government, then privatized, and all of us who are living in this revolution are working to build a commercial side of these companies. What's the most impressive single thing to me is how this is very quickly turning from a U.S.-centric internet system into a global internet exchange mechanism. What's going to go on here in this chart, many of you have seen these kind of charts, uh, we're going to have a doubling, clearly, of people using the internet. Everybody's got some different figures. These are about as good as I've seen. But the internet users by region is what I want to emphasize here. If you look at the chart of 2000, you can see, of course, that North America has about 43.2% of the users, while Asia Pacific about 20.6, Western Europe 25.1. Um, by 2005, you will see the change in the figures. You will see about a 13% projected decline in U.S. Uh, population use. Obviously, the number of users will be going up, but the percentage will be going down on a worldwide basis. And Asia Pacific will be 24.8. So almost one-fourth of the world's online population will reside in the Asia Pacific region by 2005. The message I'd like to leave you as I travel across the globe is, uh, Three years ago, uh, there were very few people in Asia that we do business with who were talking to me about the e-commerce or internet revolution. Uh, when I went back and talked to major Japanese leaders about the, the future of this industry about nine months ago, 
um, they were coming up and talking to me about the fact that they were going to be announcing within months setting up major internet units in their own companies, spinning out companies, trying to take them public, putting billions of dollars into the internet and e-commerce business. So you have a dramatic change that's gone on in my mind in the last 24 to 36 months. People everywhere in the world are starting to get the fact that they better get in on this, they better figure out what to do. They're very uncertain about what to do and how they'll ever make money with it, but this is a dramatic change. Internet usage around the globe, about 50% of the U.S. population is now online. You'll see internet usage here in this chart in the top 15 countries. One point I'd like to make about this, I just recently returned from Beijing where we spent time with the People's Republic of China officials who run the internet, the CNNIC, also signed agreements with the leading companies in Asia in Hong Kong. Uh, one of the most impressive things to me in spending time with the Chinese officials uh, was the fact that their key questions are, uh, why do you Americans believe that when we have 1.8 billion people who are Chinese speaking, in this world that you can continue to have us all type English into the browser line. That's got to change. It will change. I I'm telling you that if you're in this business, you better pay attention to this market by market. You better be building products and services that take advantage of the fact that there are 1.8 billion Chinese speakers in this world. You better be taking account of the fact that most people don't speak as a native language English. This is going to have a revolutionary next impact upon all of our businesses. If you're not attentive to it, you're going to fall behind quickly. CCTLDs, for those of you not familiar with this, in the early days of the Internet, the way these systems were architected and designed was there was a country code assigned to each country. So there are about 243 international country codes. There are about 191 active registries around the globe who take uh, domain name registrations for these country codes. About 81 are what we call uh, unrestricted. About 110 are restricted. And there are about 2 million plus registered addresses with these country codes. The point I want to make here is that what I'm seeing is where these were very restrictive. For instance, if you lived in country X, the, the registration process to get something like a domain name was you might have to go to a local police station uh, or a government agency. You had to fill out a bunch of papers, show identification, maybe you'd get your domain name someday. This is rapidly changing. Many of the countries who are now seeing this and understanding it are taking these restrictions off. So anybody in the world is starting to be able to re register in some of the country codes. So each country has a country code. Interestingly enough, the country codes have never been much used, but I anticipate that that will grow over the next five or ten years. There's a lot of business around that business for those of us in the dot-com industry. Let me talk for just a couple of minutes about the other side of this. Um, this is the, the fact that the Internet's dramatic growth requires changes today for the Internet of tomorrow, and I break this down into three very simple areas. Operations, business, and policy and law all are equally important to make sure that the Internet wave continues to roll over the globe unhindered. The original Internet infrastructure was not designed for e-commerce. No one ever thought about it being used for what we're all using it and want to use it for today. And, and the key point here to me has always been, since we got into this business in 1995, that stability of the infrastructure must be maintained during the Internet's growth. If there's not stability across this infrastructure for whatever reason, uh, security, operationally, uh, technically, uh, we're just not going to have confidence of people to use these systems. We won't have uh, business people's confidence. You certainly won't have consumer confidence. We're solving those problems, and everybody should be concerned about that and work hard to see that this does not have glitches in it. Number two, business does need the freedom to innovate and develop. And e-commerce, in my mind, will flourish if the Internet remains an open, unrestricted environment. Uh, I've never been one to say that the government does not have a role in the Internet. I disagreed with many of my colleagues in Silicon Valley for five or six years now who wanted the government never to say the word Internet. They believe the government should never have anything to say about e-commerce. First, that's not a pragmatic point of view. It never has been and it never will be. But number two, it is incumbent again upon you who are the leaders and all of us in this business to make your voices known because if there are policies in the next area and legal decisions that are made in area number three on my chart that hinder 
the freedom for us to develop and move on to the next levels of these kinds of businesses, but this industry will be dramatically impacted. As I love to say, the golden goose of the new economy will have its wings clipped. And if we have that happen, the dramatic ripple effects through this economy could really be something that would not be something any of us in this country would like to see. The third area is policy and law. Uh, I'm sorry to say that as a business person, I learned too much about this through Network Solutions because we happened to be in the middle of those debates that were very, very contentious. But I learned a lot of lessons from that. First is that historically established government governance bodies must evolve to meet this new environment. And public, public policy making process is challenged while legal actions are on the rise. You all know this well. So what we've got here is a system that if the policy making bodies and governmental agencies all over the world are not able to understand this and keep up with the times, they'll make very bad decisions. And, and I would say this. Um, the current administration in this state of Governor Gilmore and Don Upson to Secretary of Commerce, one of, the, one of the best things that's ever happened to us in this state is the forward-thinking approach that they took in terms of the governor's IT commission uh, adopting the first comprehensive set of internet legislation. That is being copied all over this country our model that is being looked at all over the world. So thank heavens that we had that kind of thing happen in this state. Key issues facing the global internet economy. Uh, there are many people who believe that the internet e-commerce dot-com economy is over. For me, that's hard to understand, but I debate and argue those people all over the world at different meetings. What I say is we're still in the early stages of the net's growth. We have not seen anything yet. The kind of things that have been unleashed all over the world, whether it's multilingual domain names, whether it is capability to put goods and services across these networks that no one's ever dreamed of yet, whether it is the folks in Japan coming up to you that two years ago couldn't talk to you about internet or e-commerce or now showing you their new handheld wireless devices so everybody can get up to the minute subway schedules as they ride on the crowded subways in Tokyo. They can order their airline tickets. They can get movie passes. You name it. This is revolutionizing that. We, we haven't seen anything yet. Let your mind run wild. There will be hundreds, if not thousands, of new dot-com companies set up over the next two, three, four years. Secondly, operations. There has to be continued global recognition of a secure, stable system that is required for e-commerce to grow. Business. New regions of the world will present opportunities and challenges, particularly, as I mentioned, in Asia Pacific. And policy and law. Uh, ICANN and other bodies must understand that operations and business issues in developing new policy and legal standards have to be cranked into this. Otherwise, you will start to hinder the golden goose of the new economy. I'm just going to mention these. I'm not going to talk to you about them in any detail. I call this policy and law. These are global issues. They started here as U.S. domestic issues. They've quickly gone to all parts of the world. Domain name disputes. There will be these for many years to come. Two, intellectual property issues. All of you who are in the business on the legal side know of the monumental struggles. Uh, companies are spending millions of dollars on Capitol Hill on IP trademark issues around the internet and the e-commerce world. Taxation, you all know how contentious this is. Uh, anyone who ever believed that most every government worldwide would not uh, consider quickly how do they get their hands on any revenue tax-wise coming across the global internet is foolish. They will. Everybody in the world is thinking about how do I take my piece of this action if this becomes a true new economy that's running in parallel with the old economy. That is going to be one of the most ongoing contentious debates any of us will ever be involved in privacy, encryption, content issues. These are the typical laundry lists that we've all been involved in. We testify, we argue, we show up at meetings, we debate these, and for good reason, because they have a direct impact on your business growth. The last three I've added in the last six or eight months to my talks around the globe, because what I've seen over the last four or five years as I've been on the front line of defending positions from the business side is uh, there is a tremendous amount of what I call fuzzy-headed thinking out there. Everything from, you know, the Internet is owned by the world's people, for instance. Well, what in the world does that mean? I've heard people all over the globe talk about that. It bears no semblance to reality of the way business or government or any of us work. You know, 
the people's property. I mean, you can't imagine all over the world what fuzzy-headed views are held about, you know, what is this e-commerce thing? What are dot-com companies really up to? You know, are all of the dot-com companies out there taking customer information and using it for sinister purposes? You know, is the CIA daily monitoring everything that you're doing in your email? These are widespread views around the globe, and some of them lead to very bad policy and decision making in different corners of the globe. So watch out for that kind of stuff, and if you see it, you know, prick your ears and, and eyes up and, you know, argue with these people because this is not sound business or policy thinking, in my opinion. National threat views. Th this is something that has been very interesting to watch, especially in Europe. Over the last two or three years when I would go to Europe and visit with government officials there, uh, a, a threat started to emerge. And it was, as many of you, some of you don't remember those days, but the French, for instance, in the 70s, and there were famous books written about it, believed that the United States was out to economically destroy the European continent with our new wave of business and technology. This was argued in columns of the New York Times, the Washington Post, people talked about it all over the globe, whether we were the new economic imperialists because of our economic and technical power. This view is back in Europe in spades, that this is an American invention, it's controlled in some sinister way by the United States government, all dot-commers and e-commerce companies in the United States are out to bludgeon, roll over, take over every European industry and a new dark age of economic imperialism from the United States is at hand. You can see this reflected in the policy decisions, legal actions that are being taken in Europe. I am not seeing as much of this kind of thinking in Asia. It's a much more free-minded, let's let this take its course, let's help and aid and abet this. This is a serious threat to the internet and e-commerce global revolution. You should get involved in this if you are in one of these companies. The, the, the other thing that's arisen is a regulatory mindset. Uh, I was hopeful that the United States government's view, and on Capitol Hill, uh, we had been through that period, through the 70s and 80s, of let's regulate everything. And there were lots of times when governments came in, in the United States, different administrations, where they attempted to roll that mindset back. Uh, this has crept back in, here in Washington, into regulators' thinkings. And, you know, this is bad news. And uh, you're, you're familiar with the kind of things you're seeing, of agencies saying, you know, we've got to look at this, we've got to regulate, we've got to stop these people from doing bad things. There's a lot of fuzzy-headed thinking in that analysis, but let me tell you, this is going to come. It's coming, it's coming. So, you know, again, you better get active because the regulatory mindset is back in my mind in Washington about we have got to regulate the e-commerce industry. That is not good news. It's a wrong way to think about this revolution. The last thing I'd like to talk to you about is a, a few interesting observations that I have from, again, my travels and being at a lot of these conferences. I, I'm completely convinced, number one, that the wave of mergers and consolidations will continue. We're a clear example of that, being the world leader in domain registration products and services, of banding together with the world leader in trusted information security services to create a powerhouse. There are lots of reasons to do that. I don't need to tell you about that, but I think that we are going to see that in every part of the globe. I see it happening in Europe. I see it happening in Asia. This will continue. So for those of you who have companies who want to sell those companies, uh, hopefully at high values to you and all of your fellow employee owners, uh, you know, this is a great time because if you have something real, you're going to be able to sell it. Uh, if you want to be a powerhouse, you should be thinking about acquiring things. The realization, which some of us who've been in this for many years uh, kind of chuckle when we get to dinner about and sit down and talk about it, is the realization that sets in that real business models and sound business fundamentals will, will uh, win out. All I can say about this is that, you know, I'm probably like all of you in this room. Uh, we've reviewed in our companies hundreds and hundreds of business plans. And one of the worst things that's happened in the dot-com industry is that there has been too much money around. And the result of that is, you know, 5 or 10 percent of the business plans are worth reading that have come across my desk in the last five and a half years. The rest of them are junk. We got a lot of people with a lot of junky business models that couldn't ever in a million years make a dollar who have gotten lots of money. That is not good. It's not good for the stock market. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for the venture capitalists. And it's not good for those of you who are tied into those deals because, you know, 
this is business 101. This is business fundamentals. If your idea is not sound, if you can't get people to buy it, if you're going to pour money down a rat hole, that, that's not changed since we went through the mainframe revolution, the PC revolution, the client server revolution, and the internet e-commerce revolution. Bad deals are bad deals. It doesn't matter that it's an e-commerce revolution. They're going to, there's going to be a lot more of this. There's going to be a lot more bloodletting before it's over. Is that good or bad? It's the way the economy of this country works. This is a free market economy. This is capitalism. A lot of bad money has been poured into things in every historic period where we've had dramatic transition and change. This is no different. Old economy firms will attempt to exploit their advantages over e-firms. What the bigger companies are certainly saying in every boardroom across this world, and I have been interested in my discussions when I've been invited into boardrooms everywhere across the globe to talk to them about what is this e-commerce thing and how in the world did you ever get into it and why did you do what you did. These old firms are desperately trying to figure out how they're going to get into this. And if they don't get into it, what's a damage assessment to their regular business? And if they do get into it, what's the damage assessment to their current business base? We all know this. This to me is the number one topic across boardrooms everywhere in the globe today. You know, and we in this room and in this region are sitting at one of the two ground zeros of this business. The advantages to all of us, if we're smart in business, are unimaginable. The opportunities are unbelievable over the next 10 to 15 years because every chairman of the board of every major company has his board looking at how do we get into the new economy and most don't know. So they will start to exploit their advantages. You will see old line firms attempt again for those of you who own companies that are solid companies in this industry to buy you out because it's easier to try to get in that way than it is to try to build their way into it. So you're going to see a tremendous amount of this exploitation of any advantage they believe they have. They know the customers better. They've been in business for 50 years. They think they have better management teams. They've got deeper pockets, presumably. So that's just something for everybody to be aware of because it's going to happen and we're going to see a land rush on that coming in the next five years. The cultures of the old economy and the new economy firms will cause continued trouble. My comment about this is I have frankly uh, been very interested in the comments in my discussions with senior old economy uh, executives across this globe. Uh, they believe that their cultures are so different from these new economy people that they don't know whether they're ever going to be able to make the transition. And in many cases, I believe they're right. That is bad news for those companies for the most part. They think that the freewheeling attitude, the not wearing a coat and tie, the inability to be smart about long-term business uh, is just such a dramatic difference that in many cases of, of boards I've talked to and people around the world, that they're afraid to even get into this. They think it may ruin what's been there for 50 or 100 years. These kinds of troubles that are personnel, they're cultural, their ways of thinking are so dramatically ingrained that if I ever saw a, a divide, much more in my mind than a digital divide that we talk about, this is a major, major business issue across this globe. The last thing is that lots of old economy senior executives really do not get it, and they view new economy leaders as flaky, arrogant, and flash in the pan people. And, and I will say this, I was at a conference recently with some of the major business leaders around the globe and and I had I listened to a diatribe by a major chairman of a board of one of the largest companies in the world talk about the fact that you know you people as he pointed his finger at me as a representative of the dot-com industry you people you people have never fed one single human being and you never will You've never fueled a car, and you never will. You've never made an airplane fly, and you never will. You're bad people. <laughs> so I, I took the time this week to send him the article about the island country of Tuvalu. And Tuvalu, since it has .tv, uh, got uh, you know tens of millions of dollars from one of our friends on the West Coast for .tv. And they are using that money to try to help all the people of that country. And they are putting it into infrastructure. 
and they are feeding the folks who need help in their country. Uh, he won't like that when I send that to him, that you know, there's at least one instance that I'm well aware of where some dot-com money is helping feed a small country's people. And I'm telling you that this is a kind of thinking and these are the kind of discussions that are going on all over the globe. So what I would say to all of us who are in the middle of this revolution that's driving our economy in the greater Washington area is, you know, I, I try to do everything I can to not appear flaky but before these people and not to appear arrogant that we have done something that no one could ever do or that, you know, uh, I don't have that problem of being a flesh in the pan person because they look at me like, you know, this is some strange guy because he, he's been around for 30 years in the IT industry. How in the world did he ever transition into the middle of the dot-com revolution? How did you do that? We do not get this. So all I'm saying to, to all of us, I say it to myself every day when I talk to these folks or travel anywhere, is, you know, let, let's be sound business people. Let's not appear arrogant. Let's not talk about, you know, we're going to flip these things and get out of here and get our money and run off to Tahiti. You might want to do that, but I would say to you that, you know, it's not a good thing to talk much about because there is a lot, there's a lot of resentment that has been built up across the globe about people who are in this dot-com economy. And there are a lot of non-believers and there are a lot of people who are waiting for all of you to fail because then they're going to say at the cocktail parties and at the board meetings, you know, it's really good we didn't get into that business because those people are just a bunch of flakes. They have no semblance of management understanding. They don't know what it is to make a dollar. They don't know what it is to manage thousands of people. So it's been a great learning experience for me. And uh, we are some of the most fortunate people those of us sitting here today and in the greater Washington region that exist on the face of the earth. We are at a time and a point and a place because we happen to be here that people all over the world, whatever they say about us, they want to be us. Most of them do. They would love to be sitting here at the NVTC breakfast this morning. They would love to be in your companies. They would love to be part of your technical or management team. They would love to have the unbounded opportunity at this point in history that each and every one of us in this region has. And if we do not take full advantage of that to build the great technology center of the world here in the greater Washington region and to do the right things and to treat our folks fairly who toil day and night to make people like me successful, the thousands of employees in the companies that I work with. These are the people who make it happen. And we are the luckiest people on the face of the earth. So we should always reflect at the beginning or the end of every day and be thankful for what we have because this is a very, very unique and unusual set of circumstances that we are privileged to have right here where we live and work. So I will close by saying to you that you should personally take some time to do something for our community. This has always been something that no matter how busy I've been, I've simply tried to do because it's important. And I've gotten much more out of that than I've ever put into it because I have had the opportunity to work with thousands of people here in the Washington area, many of you in this room. And you know, when it's all over, it doesn't make much difference how much money you made or if you did the great business deals of the world. That's all fine and good, but what's important is who your friends are and how you've treated people and if you enjoy going to work every day and that you live in one of the great places where you have your friends and family. So take some time to get involved in whatever it is that you want to get involved in because we live and work here. We're the people who are going to make this the great place in the future. So thank you, as always, for your time and attention. Uh, I appreciate being here this morning, and keep up your great work. We've got something going that everybody in the world wants. Thanks a lot.